In this series, I've been talking about lesser well-known nations and the roles they played in the Second World War. And today I'd like to return this series and look at a country you've probably never thought of in the context in World War II, and that is Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan was for much of the 19th century in between two great powers. One was the British Empire focused in British India, and the other was the Russian Empire to the north and both attempted to wrest control of the region through various means. There's a great video series about the British efforts to do so, the Anglo-Afghan Wars, made by my friend and history YouTuber Hikma History, if you're interested in that. Needless to say that by the start of the First World War, Afghanistan had largely fallen under the sphere of influence of the British, becoming a protectorate state. This didn't stop the central powers of the German Empire, Austro-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire from trying to exert their own influence in Afghanistan in 1915 and 1916, sending emissaries and envoys there in an attempt to win them over. This ultimately failed and Afghanistan remained neutral. However, a year after the war's end in 1919, the ruler of Afghanistan did invade British India, sparking the Third Anglo-Afghan War. And while the Afghans were forced back out of British India by the British soldiers, it did lead to Afghanistan becoming an independent country outside of British influence once again. Until 1926, Afghanistan would be an emirate, led by Emir Amanullah Khan. However, from 1926 onward, it would be the Kingdom of Afghanistan. Amanullah would set out many liberalizing reforms in several areas, for example, in women's rights, banning the, or well, not banning, but uh, making it not compulsory for women to wear the burqa, as well as in education for both sexes. Unfortunately for him, this actually ended up alienating many of the more traditional tribal leaders who in 1928 would kickstart the Afghan civil war, leading to the ousting of Amanullah from power. However, the rebels wouldn't last long and just a year later, they would in turn be removed from power by Amanullah's cousin, Muhammad Nadir Shah, who would become the next king of Afghanistan. Unfortunately for Shah, he would soon after in 1933 be assassinated by a supporter of his cousin. However, he did have a son who was Muhammad Zadir Shah, who became the next king of Afghanistan at just 19 years of age. He would also want to modernize Afghanistan, but he decided to do so in a slower, more step-by-step -step basis so as not to alienate the same tribal leaders by liberalizing too quickly. As well as reforms in education, he also set about building up the infrastructure of Afghanistan with roads and railroads to remoter areas to make it a more unified kingdom. For the most part, Afghanistan remained very rural and very traditional throughout this period. In 1934, he also showed that Afghanistan was looking outwards, joining the League of Nations and fostering relations with various powers, including the Weimar Republic and with the Soviet Union. Now, when five years later in 1939, war broke out, Afghanistan declared itself to be neutral. Now, you might be thinking, Afghanistan, it's far away from the battlefields in Asia and in Europe and later in North Africa. Of course, it's going to be neutral. But this wasn't actually that clear at the start of the war because Afghanistan had developed close relations with Nazi Germany, in particular also with fascist Italy and to a lesser degree with Imperial Japan as well. This largely came in the form of Nazi Germany being the largest investor in Afghanistan. Many of the reforms in terms of infrastructure and education had to be paid for and some of the biggest investors for Afghanistan were in Germany at the time. There's also the fact that the Germans were very keen on helping build up the Afghan military, perhaps seeing them as a state that they could use to fight against British influence in the region, both in Mesopotamia, as it was known then, and in British India. And to this extent, the Germans made over some 15 million Reichsmarks to the Afghan government for help building up their army. In return, the Afghans allowed the German Abwehr or spy service to use Afghanistan as a base from which to spy on the British in India. I've already talked about India's role in the Second World War if you're interested in looking at that in a separate video. 
And it's also true that in 1937, when the Afghans were extending the air force, they bought planes from the British and from the Italians, which at that time was ruled over by Mussolini, a close ally of Adolf Hitler's. Now, Nazi Germany was the main power that invested in the Afghan army. And this is clear if you look at the uniforms and particularly the helmets that they were using. The German style Stahlhelm, which would be incorporated in the 1930s and worn throughout the 1940s and 50s by the Afghan army. German military instructors would also make their way to Afghanistan to teach them methods of drill. And in fact, they seemed to be very impressed with how the Afghan army was performing forming on these parades and so gave them the nickname of the Prussians of the Orient. Now, of course, this was all very worrying to the British and especially at the start of the war in late 1939 and in 1940, the British were particularly concerned about Afghanistan falling under the Nazi sway. They were also quite worried about it falling under the Soviet Union sway because, of course, the Soviet Union actually bordered Afghanistan to the north. And the British were concerned that the Soviets, just as they had done with Poland, might march across the border and claim it for its own. Now, the reason why this never actually happened and also why Af the Afghans never actually joined the war on the side of the Germans, despite getting all this military aid from them, can largely be boiled down to the Operation Barbarossa and the fact that the Germans turned on the Soviets. This meant that if Afghanistan had joined the war, they wouldn't just be fighting the British on the southern side, but they would also be at war with the country directly to the north. And so if they had joined the war then, they probably would have been sandwiched between Soviet forces and British Indian forces. Now this sounds perhaps like an unlikely scenario given how busy the Soviets and the British were in Europe, but actually it's not that unthinkable because the British did just that in 1941 in Iran to cast out the pro-fascist government in Iran and set up their own more loyal government in their eyes in the region. Following this, Afghanistan decided to hedge their bets with the Allies and they removed all the German and Italian servicemen and spies from their territory, thus hoping to ward off a similar invasion in Afghanistan as it happened in Iran. They kept their army on high alert and it's generally thought that the Afghan army was a, quite a good fighting force had it been tested at the time. It might actually have been tested on several occasions because the Afghans before definitively siding with the Allies and remaining neutral having removed the Germans and the Italians from their territory had actually sent out envoys to Berlin to ask how much support they would get if they waged a war with the British across in British India. Now, in 1944, the biggest conflict that Afghanistan would actually engage in would be with itself in an inter-tribal conflict and not with either the Allied or the Axis powers. This came as a large part because of famine during in the region, as well as the fact that the old tribal system of conscription to keep up that army which they had ready in case they were invaded by either side, had largely bypassed the tribal leaders, who in the past had been the ones to select men from their village to join the army and then these men would serve in the local vicinity of their village. However, the new system meant that men were just plucked out of these communities and taken to fight somewhere or to serve somewhere much further away, which caused a lot of resentment from the tribal areas. There was also the fact that some of these tribal leaders were supporting the deposed King Amanullah, who had been king in the 1920s. There was also a rumor that the Afghanistans passed on to the British that Amanullah was in Germany and that he was actively asking the Axis powers to invade Afghanistan and put him on the throne and that he would from there help them to invade British India and thus take over the crown of the British Empire. However, this never actually happened because of the worsening state on the Eastern Front and because the Germans had their fingers in too many other pies. It makes for quite an interesting alternate history though. In the end, the British Indian Air Force actually helped the Afghan government to fight against the tribal leaders and they were successful in defeating the tribes in 1947, by which time, of course, the Second World War had come to an end in both Europe and in Asia.
Now, this would be a very important year for Afghanistan because it's also the year of the British partition of India, where the British Raj would become the two independent nations of India and of Pakistan, at that time still consisting of what's today Pakistan and Bangladesh. Afghanistan would largely fall on the Pakistani side of this conflict when India and Pakistan went to war for the first time in 1947 because of the conflict with tribal leaders. Because Pakistan also had a tribal area, they could help one another with that. However, it would be the neighbour to the north that would cause Afghanistan the most problems, the Soviet Union. They increasingly turned to the Soviet Union in terms of their army. And I think it's by the 1950s and 60s that most of the Afghan generals and military instructors were being trained either in the Soviet Union or by the Soviets. As a result, communism grew throughout Afghanistan. And in 1973, there was a pose, there was a coup that deposed the king of Mohammed Zadi Shah and instead instated a communist government. Soon, those old tribal leaders in the countryside would once again be rising in re revolt against the now communist government. And six years later, in 1979, Soviet troops would cross into Afghanistan to help its puppet Afghan communist government fight against these rebels. This would be, of course, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which would last another 10 years until 1989. And from that point on, if you've watched any of my videos on Afghanistan, you'll be quite familiar with the story of what occurs then. So the Second World War is an important period in Afghanistan. Apart from the tribal revolts of 1944, 5, 6 and 7, they seem to be fairly peaceful years in Afghanistan, certainly compared with other areas. But a good exercise in alternate history is perhaps to look at what if Afghanistan had decided to join the Axis and invade British India. Afghans had invaded the uh, Indian plain many times throughout history, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. So it would be interesting if that could perhaps have triggered a revolt in India as well, or if we should see this as actually being a part of the Second World War, or rather just the cyclical rhythms of, of the uh, Indian subcontinent and Afghanistan there. But anyway, I thought it was very interesting to look at Afghanistan in the Second World War, a little bit different to the other videos. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoy this series, if you want to see more videos on other countries in the Second World War, and if so, which ones. In the meantime, I have been Hilbert, and this has been The History.